Soviet command was very optimistic at the beginning of the Winter War, hoping to take Finland's most important cities in a matter of weeks. But despite being severely outnumbered and outgunned, the Finns offered a dogged resistance. In the first episode of our series on the Winter War, we described the build-up to the conflict and the opening moves on the Karelian Isthmus, and this second episode will continue with the battles on this front. If you're interested in the history of this era, don't forget to check out our second channel, The Cold War. The link is in the top right corner. Shout out to Conqueror's Blade for sponsoring this video. Conqueror's Blade is a free-to-play tactical MMO for PC that's set in a vast open medieval world where the player becomes a warlord commanding an army of 55 diverse units, from cataphract lancers to winged hussars to tertio arquebusiers, with the ultimate goal of creating an empire. Season 3 Soldiers of Fortune has just started. Prepare for a new era of Conqueror's Blade with a new season, new class, new units and new battle pass. The new season adds a maul as the 11th weapon class of the game, alongside new units like Pavis Crossbowmen, Condacieri Guards and a new artillery unit Falconetti Gunners, armed with cutting-edge cannons that will tear through enemies like a hot knife through butter. There are 100 new levels of rewards to work through in Season 3. Create or join a house to form an alliance with friends and rival players. Support our channel and play this excellent medieval game by clicking the link in the description and registering an account. Everyone who registers through our link gets a free 7-day premium account, which grants extra bronze, honor and earned XP for a limited time. On the Western Karelian Isthmus, the initial Soviet attempt to break through was focused on the area between Summer Village and Lake Morlanyabi, defended by the Finnish 1st and 5th Divisions, but it failed. As December progressed, the Soviets continued to concentrate forces in the area. The Soviet 24th Division attempted to push the Finnish 1st from the area around the lake, with no results. A new plan was devised. The 90th, 123rd and 138th Divisions were to join the attack from the west to advance in the area near Summa. The attack was planned for the 17th of December, but the freezing weather prevented the Soviets from using their tanks. Still, after a short bombardment, the 90th Division attacked the Finnish positions. This attack continued until the 22nd, with the Soviets losing hundreds. Only on the last day of the onslaught did the attackers manage to advance a little bit, as their tanks were finally able to participate. The 123rd Division started its attack near Munaswo on the 17th, and its tanks achieved a minor breakthrough, but the infantry lagged behind, and by the end of the day, 23 of 35 Soviet tanks were destroyed. Another attempt to advance was made on the next day, but the Soviets used the same route, which allowed the enemy artillery to destroy many tanks. Soviet artillery lacked munitions in that area due to logistical issues, and the attack didn't happen. To the west, the 198th Division was slightly more successful, managing to get close to the Manaheim Line bunkers. The high point of this attack happened on the 19th, as both divisions advanced, reaching the forests around Summa. Unfortunately for the Soviets, the staging areas of their attacks were targeted by the Finnish artillery with ease, and they were losing dozens of tanks every day. At the same time, the Finns lacked their own armor, so the gains from the counterattack on the 20th were modest. Still, this was largely a stalemate. The Soviets lost thousands. Meritskov sent a telegram to the headquarters, basically admitting that a quick breakthrough was impossible, and each bunker would have to be taken one at a time. The Finns attempted to use the concentration of the Soviet troops to the south of Summa. 6th Division, which was near Vipuri in reserve, was sent to the front with an order to attack the southwest of the village and surround the Soviet divisions. Simultaneously, elements of the 5th Finnish Division were ordered to move at Munaswo. This attack happened on the 23rd, but failed due to the lack of coordination with other parts of the front. The Finns suffered almost 1,500 casualties and were forced back. The troops called this poorly planned attack the Idiot's Nudge. The Soviet attacks became more focused after that. The 90th Division was tasked with taking the Popius Bunker, 
but this wasn't an easy task, and in the last eight days of the year, the Soviets lost thousands in that area. Meanwhile, the region of Ladoga Karelia was defended by Haskinen's 12th and 13th Infantry Divisions, facing off against the Soviet 8th Army under Khabarov, tasked with moving 90 kilometers inland in 10 days. The Soviet 18th and 168th Divisions were to attack between Lakes Ledega and Yanis, while the 56th was to attack the Loimala Crossroads and the 1st Rifle Corps was to advance to the north. The 1st Rifle Corps' initial attack was successful, and it took the strategically important Swoyabi on December 2nd. Elements of the 12th Finnish Division tried to counterattack, but were forced back by the superior Soviet firepower, taking casualties. Some Finnish units started retreating beyond the Kola River in order to avoid being outflanked from the north. Mannerheim was not happy, reacting by replacing Haskinen with Hegland and sending Group Talvela to reinforce this front. This new force attacked the village of Swoyabi from the northwest, which diverted the Soviets' attention and allowed the battered Finnish units to the south some respite. After a short pause, the Soviets started attacking along the front on the 8th, but as was the case on the Karelian front, the Finns used the time they had to reposition their artillery, which inflicted heavy damage on the attacking troops, particularly the tanks. On the 12th of December, the Soviet attempts to cross the frozen lakes to the south of Finnish positions along the river Kola also failed. The Finns crossed the Kola and counterattacked, destroying a number of tanks and artillery pieces which led to Khabarov's replacement by Stjern. On the same day, the Soviets attempted to encircle the enemy from the north by crossing Lake Swoyabi on skis, but were stopped once again. As the temperature plummeted to minus 25 degrees Celsius on the 18th, the Soviet headquarters ordered the 8th Army to halt the offensive and defend their modest gains. The Finns were less perturbed by cold, and on the 20th, launched a counterattack against Natalia, which connected the crucial Loimala Pitsieki Railroad. This counterattack, along with one on the 23rd, was unsuccessful, but it prompted the Soviets to attack in that area, hoping to break the line. These attacks continued until the end of the year, and the Soviet losses were considerably higher than those of the Finns. On the southern part of that front, the 56th and 158th Soviet divisions outnumbered the 13th Finnish 3 to 1, and as the defenders' positions were overrun around Kasnaselka, they retreated and formed a defensive line in Kitila and to the north of it. The Soviet advance reached the area on the 11th. Thankfully for the defenders, they had coastal artillery on Valamo Island and in the village of Salmi, which was used against the armor, destroying a number of tanks. The Soviet plan near Kitila was to attack the village itself with the 168th Division and use the 18th Division to advance towards Lakes Siskiyabi and Rokoyabi. Although some advance was made to the south of Siskiyabi on the 12th, the Finnish fighting retreat was costing the Soviets dearly. At the same time, the initial rapid Soviet advance stretched their supply routes. Most of the tanks were kept back both as a deterrent against a counterattack and to save fuel. The defenders wanted to exploit this, and a counterattack was ordered on the 12th. The plan was to cut off the Lemeti Road and either surround the Soviet 168th and 18th Divisions or force them back. Three task forces were created to tie down the enemy or strike deep in the first major Finnish counterattack of the war. Task Force Archer moved towards the lakes Kotayabi and Saksyabi, avoiding the roads. On the one hand, that allowed them to avoid the Soviet troops, but on the other, when they finally came into contact with the enemy near Kotayabi, they were too exhausted and didn't proceed much, save for one battalion, which managed to capture a section of the road to the south of Saksyabi. Task Force Bullet attempted to move towards the lake Hakiyabi and then south to Saksyabi but was also sighted by the Soviets and forced back without reaching its objective. Meanwhile, the defensively oriented Task Force Ram had a critical situation, as the enemy managed a minor breakthrough around Kitila Station. However, they managed to push the Soviets back and plug the gap in the defenses. As the attempts to cut the Soviet forces on the Lemeti Road failed, 
the leaders of the Finnish 13th Division decided to attack towards Mitro in order to split the Soviet 18th Division. That was a logical decision, since its units controlled a wider front than the others. However, the two-pronged attack was unsuccessful, and once again the Finns had to retreat with casualties. Using that, the Soviets moved the units of the 18th Division, taking Rokoyabi and getting to the south shore of Lake Siskiyabi. The Finns once again tried to stop this attack by counterattacking towards Mitro, but were repelled. Unfortunately for the Soviets, they also were suffering casualties, especially from frostbite. So by the early hours of the 17th of December, the Finns retook Rokoyabi and territory around Siskiyabi. Task Force Archer was moved to the west and attempted to cut the Soviet supply lines to the southeast of Lake Siskiyabi. They actually succeeded on the 18th, which forced the Soviets to divert more troops from the southeast to restore their line of communication. However, that meant that their divisions were not getting the requested reinforcements. Their foe was going to use that, and the Finns started to attack across the front. For the first time since the beginning of the war, the Soviets had to defend, and although they were successful, on the 27th, Task Force Bullet attacked to the southeast, taking Urmar, which cut the Lemeti Road, making it impossible to supply the Soviet divisions quickly. The Red Army's attempts to retake Urmar failed repeatedly, and their 168th and 18th divisions were attacked constantly. By the beginning of January, the Soviet salient at Siskiyabi was pushed towards the Lemeti Road. The Finns were still outnumbered on this front, but their dogged resistance and deep raids not only stopped the Soviet attack, but created an opportunity for the Finns to go on the offensive in January 1940. Meanwhile, to the north of Lake Swoyabi, the Soviet 1st Rifle Corps pushed the Finns back 60 kilometers away from the border. This was a crucial region for the Finns, and they couldn't have afforded to retreat more as that would have opened the troops around Laduga to attack from the north. To stem the tide, Manaheim appointed Colonel Talvela and reinforced him with additional troops, collectively known as Group Talvela. The colonel was a hero of previous wars, and his appointment immediately improved morale. Still the Soviets pushed, and on the 8th of December took the river crossing over Kivisalmi. Talvala needed to do something drastic to change the situation, and on the night of December 9th, Task Force Payari counterattacked. A third of the unit tied up the Soviet forces across Kiviselmi, while the rest crossed the lake and attacked the enemy 139th Division from the south. Apparently this attack surprised them, and the Soviets not only suffered losses from Finnish fire, but also started shooting at each other in confusion which continued long after Piari returned to his initial positions. This daring raid also helped with morale. At the same time, as was the case on other fronts, the Red Army moved too quickly in this area, which stretched their supply lines and made further attacks more difficult. Reinforcements were requested, but due to the nature of the war, they wouldn't arrive in the region until much later. Most of the Soviet troops needed some rest, but that allowed their enemies to dig in. To the north, the Soviet 155th Division was finally stopped by the Finns. More dangerous for the Finns was the arrival of the Soviet 718th Regiment to the area in the center of their line, which threatened the integrity of the front. Their attack pushed the Finns back somewhat, but on the 10th of December, the Soviets were bogged down in what was later known as the Sausage War. The Red Army's troops to the south attempted to assist, but were stopped in the area of Lake Tobayabi, suffering hundreds of losses. Talvala didn't mind continuing this wave of victories, but his soldiers were as tired as their counterparts, so the front was quiet on the 11th. The Finns had planned a counterattack for the next day. Task Force M would attack the enemy head-on to the north of Tobayabi village, while Payari would attack from the flank. In this attack, the Soviets were forced back, losing more than 1,000 men and valuable equipment against 300 losses for the Finns. 
Over the next day, the Finns pushed the invaders so much that the Soviet leadership was forced to bring in the 75th Division from Swoyabi to assist the retreating 139th. This played a role in the replacement of Khabarov with Stjern, which we mentioned previously. However, the strict disciplinary actions of Stjern didn't improve the morale of his soldiers. The Finnish attack in the area continued until the 16th, when they reached the village of Aglayabi, pushing even the fresh troops to the east. Both sides started concentrating more troops in the area during the next day. Although the Finns had the initiative, their attack on the 18th and 19th ended in failure. The Soviets brought tanks to the village and used them to start a counterattack on the 20th, but the Finnish anti-tank guns proved deadly, destroying them and allowing the Finns to counterattack. By the end of the day, the Red Army's troops were squeezed into the village. Despite the fact that the Soviet air forces attacked the enemy over the course of these days, the forest terrain rendered their runs ineffective. The Finnish attempts to take the village continued, and on the 21st of December, the Soviet leadership finally gave the order to retreat to the Itayoki River. The Finns attempted to cut the retreat and killed many Soviets, but the encirclement failed. Still, Aglayabi was the first major victory for Manaheim's army during the war. The Soviets lost around 6,500 men in these battles, while the Finnish casualties were fewer than 800. But was that enough? You will learn about that in the next video in the series, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We also have a second channel called The Cold War, and you can find the link to it in the description and the top right corner. Consider subscribing. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.